Okay, uh, so tonight's topic is the uh, is the type checker. Let me share my screen, um, and we can get going. Now, as usual, uh, please feel free to ask as many questions or have as much side commentary and discussion as you wish in the comments section. You can say this is a sort of informal session, although we are we are recording these and they will sort of form part of the um, kind of deep dive tutorial material for people coming to .NET F Sharp and wanting to get involved in contributing to the compiler. <coughs> uh, so for those who haven't been along before, the level of the session uh, is fairly, you know, we go as deep as we can and uh, yeah, definitely aimed at, you know, the kind of level of people who actually want to be able to go in and change a code, fix bugs, implement features, understand the actual uh, the actual compiler implementation. So it can go quite heavy, quite deep. Uh, I am now sharing my screen and I hope you can see, all see it. And uh, I have in fact just built up Visual F Sharp. I have recently discovered, I'm, I'm using Windows, uh, but I've if you're using Windows and you want to do some IDE tool development as well, I've recently discovered the magical deploy flag on uh, on the command line build. I'm a, so I do plenty of command line work for building. Uh, and this makes it the equivalent of uh, building in Visual Studio and deploying the bits uh, so that if you start Visual Studio. So if I, now, if I now start Visual Studio and it deploys it into a magical uh, part of the registry called the Ros the Roslyn Dev Hive of Visual Studio. This is all in the in, documented in the readmes in Visual F Sharp. And you can start Visual Studio like this and you will be using the deployed built IDE development tools uh, to uh, when Visual Studio starts. Okay, so I'm going to start Visual Studio. Uh, and I will, in fact, open the compiler solution itself using my freshly built set of compiler, F Sharp Interactive, visual editing tools, everything. So if there's a bug in main, we will find it as we go along. The other thing was mentioning is that this is also the full Visual Studio tooling in this solution. We also have a uh, solution that is just the compiler or just the compiler exactly. service in the test. So if you're working on Linux, you can just uh, build this uh, using, I believe it, uh, it will be a variation on the build script. Uh, there's a build script here, and you can just build these ones here if you wish, or just edit edit those using INI to Visual Studio Code on Linux, and everything should be good to go. Uh, but I am working on Windows, and I am using the Visual Studio tools, and I am going to close down these files, and I we are going to start talking about the type checker. I will be switching back and forth between my browser here, where I will be looking at .NET F Sharp. Uh, F Sharp here. And we can start here. Let me just admit Max. Hello, Max. Welcome along. And Soren, welcome along. We're just about to get started with looking at the type checker. This is done talking and Vlad I'll leave you to do the um, to admit people in at the lobby thanks sure uh, right yeah. okay. uh, Okay, so we want to we want to talk about the type checker. So, source F sharp. This is where all of the compiler is, and we we're going to look at two particular files really today, which is check declarations and check expressions. And this, uh, if we go to our documentation in the compiler in the docs, and we look at the compiler guide that's been our 
our sort of guide through this whole journey we've been taking so far. You'll notice we are in the type checking phase here, and we're talking about a set of things from sequ sequentially type checking files, which interacts with pattern match compilation, which it, and interacts with constraint solving. So there should be a direct link there. And then after all those three are done, after each file, we do a set of post inference type checks. And so these are this this sequentially type checking files is the check declarations and check expressions. And if we uh, let's see how to open up .NET a sharp again. Uh, we never go down. Let's split this off. And we'll look at source F sharp. Then we have pattern match compilation is unsurprisingly in pattern match compilation dot FSI and FS. Constraint solving is unsurprisingly in constraint solver dot FS and FSI. And post inference type checks is you've guessed it in post inference checks down here. Looking at that in the compiler solution, we are down in the um, we are down in the logic area here. So we're looking at these ones: pattern match compilation, constraint solving. I guess there's also checking of printf format strings and interpolated strings. There is also post inference checks we've looked at, check expressions. Oh, there's also check computation expressions, which is split out, split out to a separate file, and check declarations. So let's now orient ourselves by looking at some of the signatures to see some of the types involved. And we have to check two kinds of files. So this is check declarations. And we have to check signature files. FS, uh, FSI files, you can see examples of this uh, here, and you have to check implementation files. And we have a routine to type check one signature file, and it takes a whole bunch of arguments, and it takes an environment, and it takes a parsed signature file input, which is has come out of the parser. And it eventually, this is a monad, the workflow, the computation expression, it eventually gives us one of, it gives us a bunch of things, gives us a new environment. It gives us the results of checking a signature file, which is really a type of, it's a type, a signature file is sort of a massive big type declaration. So it's the type of a module or a namespace. And uh, it, uh, some flag, I've forgotten what that flag is. We can find that out as we go along. Now, if we're doing an implementation file, it's very similar. Take a whole bunch of stuff at the top. Environment. Uh, we have an optional signature. If we've already, if it had a signature and we've already checked the signature, then we then we have the signature uh, sort of infer the type that the thing that represents the whole signature. We have the thing that represents the parsing of the implementation file, and it eventually gives us a bunch of things. Most crucially, it gives us the typed implementation file, which is a sort of elaborated TAST typed abstract syntax tree for everything. And it also gives us a final type. It will have checked whether the signature, whether this thing here matches the signature if it was present and gives us the final overall type. It gives us an environment that's active at the end of the implementation file. And it also splits out any uh, top level attribute declarations that really belong to the assembly rather than to the file. So it does a little bit of splitting out of things. And yeah, those are, those are the two things we have to implement, and those are the top the uh, type checker. Now, if we just look, we, we've seen some of these things in previous sessions. The globals that is active throughout all the logic of the compiler. Uh, this we've we've had a look at this, but this is one of these big uh, structures containing a whole lot of things we expect to be able to find that the compiler has some logic that it knows about, uh, whether it's things about particular types in the .NET libraries or uh, uh, particular entry points into f .core. This is just a big table of intrinsics, essentially. Uh, it goes a fair way down. 
Right, so that's the globals. Uh, we have to generate some names as we go along, and we want that to be the same each time we do this. And so we pass in a generator. So rather than relying on fully global state, it is sort of global through the checking of one file. We also pass in an import map, which is really all the references that we expect. Uh, so the reference, how do we how do we find reference assemblies? Okay, so uh, it gives us a table of referenced assemblies, effectively. Uh, this is also a sort of a mutable thing for a compilation unit, which represents the sort of the thing we're building up along the way uh, as we're building out the whole assembly. Uh, I think this is a, a thing to check whether we should just stop or we should give up along the way. Uh, and then do we have any hash defines active? And do we have, uh, and oh, if we do some name resolutions, should we report them to the development environment? And then some other, other flag, let's take a look at this a little further. So let's go into uh, the implement. Uh, now let's continue to orient ourselves with the signature files to get the bits and pieces of what's uh, what's around. So let's go look at. Hey, Sean. Yes, could you, question. Could, could yeah. you elaborate on like what name resolutions are in this case? Uh, yes, I in fact, uh, so part of the logic that we have here, I kind of started the story at pattern match compilation here. Okay, but there is a whole bunch of things that we build on here. And one of the things, one of the key routines, so one of them, for instance, is signature conformance, which just checks whether an implementation matches a signature. Uh, one of them is about resolving method calls and building up information about how to resolve a method call. Another is about working out what overrides what in the object or in the object programming model. Uh, Another is some um, um, logic for reading. Uh, so these infos here represent information about methods and properties and things from .NET libraries uh, and also declared in the f -sharp object model. This one here is about uh, a private internal protected accessibility logic. This one is about checking things like uh, processing an obsolete attribute and some other special attributes the compiler knows about. Uh, and type relations is about things like defining whether types uh, can be equivalent, whether they're equivalent up to units of measure, whether they one type can subsume another type, and and so on down the okay, line. So, so yeah, so it's the thing you asked about. Uh, so I'll get to it. I was just going to make sure I covered okay. everything else besides yeah, the one you mentioned. Uh, is so this one. The other two things. Nice print is just for uh, outputting stuff to uh, to to outputting types in a nice way, laying them out, making them look pretty, uh, replacing type inference variables and so on as part of that. Uh, and also, if we have two types, making sure we kind of display the minimal difference between two types, only display the information up to uh, what makes them actually be different. OK, but the thing you asked about was name resolution. And name resolution effectively says we have a set of using declarations, open declarations. We have a set of libraries in scope. And we have a set of uh, items in, in scope. And we just simply resolve strings to items. So we can take uh, given some particular environment. So let me give an example of the kind of routine. Here, so at the bottom, we have, for instance, um, let's take resolve expression long identifier. And this is, uh, it takes uh, a, a name resolver object. This could probably be all written in a much more object oriented way because they're all taking the name resolver object as the, this parameter. Uh, and this thing here effectively takes a list of identifiers and it either gives us an item or it gives us a, an exception, uh, it gives us a failure. And uh, if it gives us an item it, and it gives us some uh, leftover thing. So this is if you're in the middle of an expression and you want to resolve the long identifier system dot console dot right line, okay, then this will, uh, this will resolve this first to, I believe, a type, and then it will be a, a subsequent uh, resolution to then resolve the right line to a method. 
Okay, so the first resolution will give one item and then there'll be a subsequent qualified resolution on the next item. Okay, uh, okay so that's name resolution is to get from text identifiers like this to items. And items are the big long list of things at the top here, uh, which items are the set of things, uh, elements of the F sharp language. Uh, so for instance, uh, it might be a union case here, in which case you get a union case info for it. It might be an event in, dot, in a .NET library, which would be an event info. It might be a property, but there might be a, a list of possible resolutions of that property here. If there's, if there's, I think, overrides or abstracts involved, or it might be a method, and you'll get a list of methods and some other information. Okay, so that's from text, and that is what uh, we were referring to back here with name resolution. And whenever name resolutions happen, uh, during compilation, we also report them to a sync. Uh, and when this logic is run inside the IDE, as we're actually doing at the moment, then uh, we will implement that sync. So we can take a look at the sync. And in fact, it's an optional thing, and it's an optional I type check result sync here. And that is effectively this object here. When you're plugging into the IDE, it will uh, it will collect up resolutions. No, no, we will notify here. Each time we do a name resolution, we will sort of notify um, whenever anything comes into scope. OK, we will notify an entire new name resolution environment. Whenever we work out that an expression has a particular type, we notify. Whenever we do a name resolution of anything at a particular position, with a whole bunch of context here, we will notify that it uh, resolved to some particular item. Similarly, when we resolve method overloads, when we resolve printf formatting or open declarations. Uh, and I think that is that is all effectively. That, so those, those. What, what what happens when you have like, for example, multiple compilation units and you have effectively multiple names being merged across uh, the same module? So you have, you know, like module list or whatever, but you have different uh, like let bound guys in each of those lists. Uh, let me give. Uh, let's I'll switch to gist uh, first, and then um, you can tell me what you mean. So, which kind of example did you mean? Could you say again which sort of example you were referring to? Yeah. So, say say you have two separate files, and you have module list in the first one, and then you have an identifier, or you have like a binding in, yeah, right, in file A, and then you have file B, and you have two different um, names, right, exactly. And so, do you, uh, want, and like, do you want X y. or Y in here? No, okay. Y, yeah, Okay. right. Yes, and so so, so somewhere you would use list.y, and somewhere you would use list.x. Yeah, exactly. Okay, uh, well, we these would actually, um, and uh, so let's say this module uh, B here and module A just to complete it out. And then in some other file, we did open A and we did open B. And then we did list.y. Yes, that's correct. Right. Uh, okay, so the F sharp name resolutions are the. So first of all, as it's, as it's building the combined name resolution between these things, then the environment will have a thing which says that the text list uh, is known to be two things. It is first known to be uh, B dot list and it is known to be A dot list effectively. The, the, the symbols for those two things. In that and order? Then in that order, because I opened this one second. Right. Uh, I think well, I, I, I'm pretty sure this is in reverse order most recently opened first. <laughs> okay. Uh, so it will then start to process list.y, and part of the rules of the language are that it will try, well, we'll do list.x so, uh, so that we fail the first one. So it will fail to find an x in here, and it will continue on and process this to look for the x here, and it finds that, and then it will report two things. Uh, it will report through the sync 
So I will just write that as this. We will, re we will report that list at some position, you know, five, whatever, whatever, uh, uh, went to b dot a dot list. No, so yeah, a dot list module a dot list. So this will be some item for module a dot list, and it will also report that x at some particular location a few characters later. Uh, whatever seven something dot 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 goes to item for value a dot list dot x. Okay, so we'll report those two things. So the the the, the sinks and other so the environment has the information necessary to process the rules of the language for name resolution, and the the sync is given the precise resolutions of those things. Does that make sense? Thanks. Okay, Grant. Uh, okay, so that's the notifies, and uh, we can, for example, see that in the um, in the IDE code down in the service, I'm pretty sure we'll find an implement. Actually, this is the implementation here, and we will find, I believe, that when we check one file in the IDE, so that's this code that's running as we speak on each file that we're looking at. Uh, it does provide a sync object to the type checker. So we'll see where that goes. That sync is passed to one of the routines, pretty much one of the routines we looked at. It's a, a type check one input. Uh, and it actually says, yes, we're going to do that with a, with a sync here. And then at the end of that, we will, after the type checking has run, and if it doesn't get cancelled, we will extract the information from the sync to build the state that is kept in the IDE to populate IDE uh, features uh, uh, in the, yeah, okay, type checking form. And you can track that down through the rest of the service code uh, it's, uh, for the IDE side of things. Great. Right, so name resolution, we were at check declarations, and uh, I'm going to take a glance over checking of expressions and then come back to check declarations. I actually uh, did, I, I had one thing that might be related to, well, it's not totally related to name resolution. It might be jumping ahead a little bit, but, uh, if you have, for example, a class and you have a static op, a static member in it, and then you have another static member in a separate compilation unit that happens later, then you have a situation where it's actually, that's considered a, I don't remember what the terminology is, but that's a, a, a member extension, right? Uh, so, to... uh, so, uh, so there are two types of extensions of types in 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 F sharp. Okay, so right. we'll, 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 this one, if it's in the same file like this, at the same, it's not in a module or anything. It's just part of the same module. The same, right? Then yeah, it gets combined. Right. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, this is called an intrinsic extension. That's right. Yeah, and it does allow you to sort of within a context of a single file to define classes somewhat incrementally and to intersperse other logic in between in here. So you, you can want. have so you can have some mutual right exactly. That's right, and it's probably being used less now that we have namespace rec available. Uh, and uh, because you can just put it at the top of your file, you know, name, namespace rec for foo or a dot b or something, or that stuff. And then these things can be generally, you, you won't need to use these anymore. So this would be if you had a static member B like this. And you'd right. I, I just remember there was a question recently in the, the Slack about someone was having trouble with that. I don't remember what the details were, but. I see if you could uh, do, uh, point me to that case, I'll, I'll take a look. I, I, won't I, think, I think it might be out of the history already, but yeah. I see, all right, um, okay. So you were asking about extensions. Was there an, a, a more specific question? You uh, was about this kind of scenario. Uh, no, it was well. I, I think part of the the related question was that uh, you've been working on the uh, 
exposing like the uh, exposing the the non intrinsic extensions to other parts of like the resolution, right? Uh, I think that might be like an SRTP related thing, but maybe did it not uh, I else see. or yeah. I, yeah. I, 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 I see, yes. So let, let's not get on to SRTP solving yeah. Uh, yeah. those constraints. Solving. This probably should be a separate topic. Actually. Separate later, yeah. Uh, and either tonight or we'll we'll do it tomorrow. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, but there, yep, yeah, okay, I'll continue on then. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Okay, uh, no, no, it's okay. Uh, it's good to split into different pieces. So let's take a look at check expressions to orient ourselves and then come back and look at check declarations. Let's start looking at the implementation. So we'll look at the signature file. It's quite a long signature file, this one, because it it's effectively exposing a lot of stuff that is only really ever used by check declarations and check computation expressions. Uh, so these three sort of form a unit, which if the F sharp tooling supported it, you could imagine them having a much simpler signature file, which encapsulated those three files themselves. It's very rare you need that in F-sharp coding, but as you know, this is one of the most complicated bits of F-sharp code around. It used to be the big, one of the biggest files in the F-sharp universe. Uh, we split it out into these three parts, uh, and that does mean this signature file is a bit larger, but it does start to expose you to some of the internal structures, the most important internal structures inside the type checker. And I just want to look at just uh, one or two things here. Uh, so let's just look at TC expression here. So we have some state that is relevant across a file. And uh, we have an expected type for the expression. This is sort of what we know about what type we think it should have. We have an environment, which includes a name resolution scope and a whole lot of other things to do with the scope. Uh, of the expression. Uh, we also have a thing called unscoped type RN. We can talk about that later. But as import, we uh, as input, we have the syntactic expression. And the result is a TAST, an elaborated type checked or bound expression. And we might have hit some type uh, variables, unscoped type variables along the way. So we return a new environment here. OK, so that's nice. That's fairly nice and simple. We have some context. We have the input. We have the result. And we have some uh, something that flows through in a functional way here. This part is mutable, as always in the compiler. If you see CNV, it represents some actually some mutable or global uh, object. It could be written in an object programming way. It should be th thought sort of the object state that is shared across uh, either a file or the one processing action, and may include some mutable accumulators. Uh, and then the rest is fairly functional. The, if you see an env structure, it is probably functional. Uh, maybe very limited uses of mutation in that. Uh, and it will probably correspond to the syntactic scope of the things that we're processing. Uh, so, uh, as you go through a let binding, for example, you'd expect to be getting a new environment as you type, de type check down through, through an expression. And you'll see similar routines here. Um, let's say we might be checking a bunch of let bindings, recursive let bindings, and so on down. Or we might be just checking a type uh, here. So those are the sort of things we build up stuff from. Let's take a little look at the environment that's active during type checking, which is here. And uh, so, so it said it represents the sort of type checking environment at a particular scope. And most of all, it's the, by far the most important part is the name resolution environment, which is itself defined in the name resolution that we were looking at separately and it's a whole bunch of tables of things that are in scope okay and if you run through name resolution.fsi you'll see how that gets built up uh, it's a functional structure 
so if, let's take a look at a couple of examples. For example, we talked about we, we talked about how to use a name resolution environment through this name resolver object. But we didn't talk about how the name how a name resolver gets built up. So a name resolver is name resolver is here. It's uh that's not what we that's not what I'm actually interested in. What I really want is this name resolution environment here. The name resolution environment contains a whole lot of tables. For instance, what are the modules and namespaces that are in scope? What are the other unqualified items? Uh, what are the um, type constructors, the, type, the types that are in scope, and whether that is why they're mangled or they're demangled names for .NET generics for here with the tick one is the, the mangled version. And then some other things you can see down the down, down, down the list. Okay, so that's a name resolution environment. And let's go back to check expressions. So I said that's by far the most important point, uh, part of the type checking environment. <coughs> oh, I wanted to show you how these name resolution environments get built up. One, one example of that. So I'm going to find where we produce one. And so, for example, um, when we do an open, when we process an open declaration, it will come down to pro calling this function, add module or namespace refs contents, so ref to name environment here, or refs to name environment. And this thing takes a name resolution environment here. And it takes a list of mod things you've opened, things that are referenced by your open system. And uh, there may be a list of those because they might come from a bunch of different assemblies. You can have different bits of the system namespace coming from different assemblies. So you might get a, <coughs> a list of things being opened by one open declaration. And you get back a new name resolution environment. So just your usual uh, functionally constructing up the name resolution environment by processing various things. For instance, when you define a type, you end up adding the type constructor to the environment. When you define an exception in F sharp, you add that to the name environment and so on all the way out of adding. You do a let binding, then you call this thing. Every let binding gets this thing gets called to give you a new name resolution environment. Okay, so that's the most important part of the type checking environment. Now there is a bunch of other stuff in here. Uh, for we can just a glance at a couple of these. Uh, they're they're related mostly to corner cases or just internal processing things. I mean, perhaps um, what's interesting here. The um, this context info is used to give better error messages, so that if we know that we're processing on the second branch of an on the else branch of an if statement, we can kind of give a better error message in certain conditions, uh, and other and sort of similar context info kind of things here. So you can see we're do, we're processing an if expression or we're processing a yield expression or something. And these cases always correspond to giving better error message error messages. They're not part of the real logic of the language, they're part of the logic of the error generation in the compiler. Uh, this is this sort of thing here is just used to process what what can we access in terms of internal visible to. Uh, but you can see here that the rest is not so not so interesting. The, re the real action is up here, and then this one is r related to type inference. We will get to that shortly. I have a kind of stupid question. That yep. The how do you how do you connect the the diagnostics to the the error? Well, 
That's right. Nothing yeah. we've nothing we've seen so far has had any diagnostics output. And one way to write the compiler more functionally would be to just have nearly everything returning both a list of errors and a list of warnings. Uh, uh, we don't do that. So diagnostics are emitted via a sync as well, and it's defined very early on in the in the in the. Um, if I've got this right, it is error logging. And it's a bit of a mess, this code. It's, it will look nice one day when we just somebody comes in and cleans it up in fairly obvious ways. Uh, the <coughs> the uh, There is a thing called an error logger, and it's got the key method, which is a diagnostic sync, and which takes a severity and a diagnostic, and the, the diagnostics also report which phase of the compiler they come from. And sometimes, uh, it's really messy, this stuff. Sometimes we uh, we capture all the errors from a certain phase and then we replay them because we might want to filter them, for instance, for sort of the scope of no warn declarations which suppress those diagnostics. So we kind of right. logically- So you basically we just have an, an imperative thing. So yeah, so we have, like, yeah. we have an imperative thing, but a bunch of sort of imperative filtering of the imperative things. <laughs> right. And it's not it's not great, but it's not it's uh, yeah, it's not great. And uh, the imperative thing is installed on a thread local, uh, uh, which is this thing here. And if we actually look in uh, error logger dot. Or was it compile thread static here? Here. It is, in fact, a thread static, this thing here that is being accessed by that static member. Uh, we could, in theory, pass the error logger around everywhere. It's not. Um, we did look at doing that once, but it is what it is, and it, it's, it works. It's like a module level global kind of thing, like, yeah. Yeah, and then so you actually emit an error by calling these. So, so for instance, you can call error R, where the R means recovery. So it, it just returns unit and continues on, and we'll just look at that definition of that thing. Error R here. So it gets the thread static error logger and it calls error R, which emits the diagnostic with an error severity. And emit diagnostic first checks whether some things are in, we should never see these just arbitrary, just internal failures. It also checks for these conditions, uh, which says, uh, are we in fact trying to report these these exceptions have particular meaning inside the compiler corresponding to their name saying we've already reported it just continue to unwind the stack uh, and otherwise we call the sync and we create our phase, phase diagnostic and we look up a thread static to say what build phase we are in okay so that's how our diagnostics get reported and that's very important so uh, did you are there actually multiple threads for compilation then or what's the uh, uh so there sorry, are, I'm going there again, are sorry, in, like, increasingly multiple threads for analysis in the sense we are liberating in fact the bits i'm using here are main branch of visual f sharp and this actually runs type checking concurrently for different files that are being edited in the oh, IDE okay. are being analyzed in the IDE. So there is some much more concurrency going on in the IDE environments. And in fact, one of the lovely things that's happening in .NET F Sharp at the moment that uh, uh, I will show you is one of the pull requests from um, Will. Uh, and Will, in fact, recently added parallel parsing to the compiler. So that will, um, through this pull request here, which has given about a 10% uh, speed up when do processing the compiler itself. And some lovely code in here. You can just see here, it's basically a parallel map here 
So over the source files where we parse each each input file. And then there's some bunch of stuff to do with diagnostics here to make sure we, we, we still emit the diagnostics in exactly the same order that we used to emit them before. Uh, so we delay them and replay the diagnostics and that's all, all good. So that's parallel parsing, but Will has also got a pull request active for uh, parallel type checking. Uh, and this is parallel. Now, you can't actually type check things in parallel, parallel in F sharp because we process sequentially and, and the results of one file are available in the next to the next file. Uh, but if you have signature files, then you can uh, type check the implementations of those in parallel. OK, so parallel type checking for implementation with files with backing signature files. So we first go through and check everything that doesn't have a signature file, plus checking the signature files, and then we go through and do the implementation files, if I've got that correct. Uh, and then this will use multiple threads and multiple active error loggers and, uh, and, and so on. So good, yes, thanks, good question. And uh, uh, can I ask one more question? Uh, why are signature files so important to type checker? For example, if we have basically the same signatures in our FS and FSI files. Uh, if you, I mean, you could imagine having a special language status for FS files which have, uh, which have full declarations of the signature, okay? So you can imagine an FS, having an FS, you know, a way of writing FS files where you fully annotated everything. Uh, yeah, you have exception and you have F sharp, except F -sharp diagnostic severity and you have I think the, the idea is basically that you don't want to have to do inference for the body of all exactly. of these, yeah. right? Yeah, that, 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 that's right. So if it was fully annotated, then you would actually have the signature ready and ready to go just from the parsing and then a simple processing without processing any of the bodies. But F sharp is what F sharp is and it uses implementations to give type information. And so the signature is not of this file is not known until we do until we process the body. You know, we're really, you know, allowing type information to flow from expressions. And this is one of the most fundamental design decisions of F sharp, where it departs from nearly every other major programming language uh, that's not in the ML family of ML Hindley Milner family of languages, Haskell and the like. And we do allow implementations to, to to give type information to the rest of compilation. And this is this is one of the key reasons why F sharp uh, has a file ordering. Uh, even if we allowed full recursion uh, across all the files, we would still have to uh, build up a collected environment across everything and start processing the declarations one by one and apply uh, apply F sharp inference to them one by one. Uh, extracting the information and propagating that to all the other consumers. Now, in the case of signature files, signature files are complete. Okay, they don't have any unknowns. There's no uh, underscores allowed in here, or if they are allowed, they have a special meaning, which just means a new type variable like this, and is, and is, but but they they are complete specification. So you just have to process a signature file. You've got all the information that other consumers of that file need. Could you just, um, um, could you just, uh, just for our education, um, um, uh, enumerate the information that does flow from um, source file to source file? Uh, I, I think for, for the purposes of type checking, uh, it, the, the information that flows from source file to source file is nothing but the signature. Okay, that's for the purposes of type checking. Uh, so even if it's got an inline, for example, the type the, the, the type checking of subsequent things doesn't depend on the implementation. Uh, so nothing but what's in the signature. Now that's not true for optimization, and in, uh, and for optimization down here in the optimizer, it it propagates information down the chain all the way down li linearly, and it can inline things that were declared in previous files, for example. Uh, now. 
And we could talk about code generation later, but that's mostly just to do with, um, you could probably run code generation in parallel. There's just some things like generating special names and getting deterministic uh, outputs and so on, which would make that a little bit trickier. But there's basically no information is propagated across files in ILXGen. So we use namespace ordering um, in files to um, moderate um, the file ordering for types that are discovered that way, that, right? That, that's right. So you, um, th th there's kind of two questions, I think, behind what you're asking. You're asking what, does, what flows from an FS file or, or an FSI, which I said the answer is it's just what's in the FSI. But there's also what flows down the chain as you uh, as you check later files. So effectively, everything in the in the FSI, the collect the whole prefix of FSI files or the whole prefix of inferred signatures for all previous files always flows to the next file. Okay, and then again, the whole that that file plus all the previous ones flow to the next one. And so there's a routine uh, in uh, it's in typed tree ops. I think it should be in here. Called combine combine CCU content fragments here, which uh, effectively combines those signature files. Okay, so we each each signature file gives rise or or each signature file or an FS file that doesn't have a signature file and has undergone type inference, one way or another, we get a module or namespace type corresponding to that thing. And then we combine the chain of them to give an overall type, which is the set of everything that's in scope from previous files. So that's this combined CCU content fragments. Does that answer your question, Kevin? Um, sort of. I mean, yes, it was, uh, yes, it, it answered my question, but it was not the answer I wanted to hear. Uh, okay. All right. Great. Uh, Kidoki. Right. So let's, um, let's continue on. Uh, and we got as far as checking declarations, and then we talked about checking expressions. And then we haven't talked yet about the constraint solver that gets used while checking expressions. So let's take a little glance at uh, checking declarations. So we'll go down to the bottom of the file and we'll look what it's like to check a signature file. Type check one signature file. The input is this thing here. Uh, this was all those parameters that we get, and this was this environment that we get. And it's one of these eventually things that is cancelable and uh, interruptible in case this, this is used for the background processing uh, that, the, I, that the development environment is doing. And the first thing is it does is create an, an, an object environment to act as a, the, file, the file state. Uh, we'll uh, skip that, but it's just a... a uh, a thing, a mutable object thing that acts as a context for all the type checking of the signature file. It then uh, it then calls TC signature elements, and it that goes through and checks the elements one by one. And first of all, it checks to see do we have a rec at the top so is this a signature file with a rec here or not and then the, the processing is different for those so tc signature elements mute rec <coughs> or non-mute rec we'll just look at the non-mutually -mut recursive case first and it is basically a fold operation so it takes the uh, environment and the definitions, normally written like this, double pipe way like this, and it folds across those, processing each uh, element. And uh, it 
processes in each element down here. So we could have an exception declaration. Let's take some example declaration here. So let's say we have a, a type declaration here in a signature file. <coughs> then that will be a... Where is it? Type declaration here. And it could be a set of mutually recursive ones. So there's a list of those. It could be uh, uh, and f equals class n or something like this. But uh, we've, only, we've only got one of them. So let's go back and take a look at that. So we're in types and it's going to uh, actually, because these are mutually recursive, uh, it's going to process a set of mutually recursive signature declarations. And then we do a whole bunch of work to process a set of mutually recursive sig signature declarations, part of which is to process a type definition. And this is quite a complicated routine, and we will get to mutual recursion and processing de definitions in a little bit. But you can see how, the, how it breaks down. Take a, a similar glance through implementation files. So if we were type checking one implementation file, here is the input here. We again create an environment for doing that. We again uh, fold across the elements here. So we uh, are we mutually recursive or not? If we are not mutually recursive, then we effectively do a sort of a manual fold operation here. We then process uh, a non-mutually recursive definition here. And again, we see the different cases. We might be defining some types. We might be doing an open declaration. Maybe uh, we might be doing a binding of some let lets here. And we just go run through and process each of those elements. Uh, let's take a look at processing an open declaration. If we have an open declaration, then we check, is it a, are we opening a module or namespace or are we opening a type? If we are opening a module or namespace here, then we first resolve those. Okay, so that is this thing where we call name resolution to say resolve this long identifier as a module or namespace. And we might get a result or we might have got a failure. And if we get a failure, we report an error and we continue on. And uh, so assuming we got some modules here, we do some checks to see various things. We, uh, we I don't know, various, various different language rules we have to process for that. But the key thing is that in the end, we open the module or namespace refs down here. And uh, that means we call, we link up with that routine we said earlier, add the module or namespace refs to the name environment, build ourselves a new type checking environment with that new name uh, resolution environment inside it. We notify the sync that we've got a new scope where some things have come into scope and we've got an open declaration in that, uh, in, in that sync. Uh, in, we've processed an open declaration and we are done. We have a new type checking environment. And once we have a new type checking environment, just going back to where we were a few more times. Hey, I have another, another stupid question. Yeah. Uh, okay. Just to say, we, sorry, just to say, once we get a new type checking right. environment, sure. we've done, we're done with our declaration. It has, it doesn't build anything useful. So that's just done by an identity function here. And we return that new environment uh, and we continue on with the processing effectively. Okay, question? Yeah, so the question, what happens if you have a conflict between, for example, uh, well, basically between static members and let bound uh, definitions? Okay, so all of those things about name resolution uh, kind of conflicts all drop out in the uh, rules and structures in name resolution.fs. So, um, so I think you might be talking about, I guess, go to a gist, a case like this, and you're probably talking about an open type declaration. Uh, if, uh, so I'd imagine that you're talking, you've got a class C, and it's got a static member called A, 
equals dot dot dot, and you've also got a let a equals dot dot dot, and you've done an open, or well, maybe there's a module here, m equal like this, and you've done an open m, and you've done an open type c, using the new open type feature for, this is in a sharp 5.0, you can all happily use this now, to use and abuse overloading in lots of ways. Uh, so you can open type C and then you go A, and let's say you call it. Uh, and you want to know about the name resolution of that long identifier. Uh, then the thing is that this open type C, if we look at the name resolution, and we look at what a name resolution environment is, the first thing we will look up is always the unqualified items environment here which uh, gives you a string and gives you an item, a unique item. One of the one of the things we've maintained in the F sharp language is that a single identifier like this only ever resolves to one thing. Okay, well, it might resolve to an over an overloaded uh, set of members here, but they all come from the same class and they're all um, got that right. Wins if you have multiple. So this will, if you have O to M, uh, well, so hang on. So you're saying if you've got, uh, yeah, so that's overloaded like that. Uh, well, let's do this one by one. So the open M will wi wipe out anything that's previously in scope. This A outscopes anything. Uh, you, you can't combine these. Right. Uh, and if there are multiple ones here, well, then overload resolution is a separate procedure which will use this information to resolve the um, the overload. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, this the other way around. Okay, yes. Yeah, so one in, in, when you look at items here, it's important that we haven't done res overload resolution at this point. Uh, that we have, um, if you look at method, it's a group of methods. And so you may get a math info list here. And so that will set uh, represent a list of potential overloads. <coughs> uh, and overload resolution is done separately. So we've taken a bit of a walk down through check declarations. And uh, let's talk a bit about um, type inference. Okay. Now, type inference, type inference. So if we if go to Hindley Milner type inference and you look at images, you'll see something like uh, this. Now, those, uh, those, that image that's on the right there, uh, it's from here, let's stick to the image here. Those one, two, three, four, five, six rules are absolutely beautiful, and uh, they they are just a bit of functional programming, really. The t-shirt. Uh, uh, they <laughs> they uh, I got told when I first started studying this stuff that yeah, when people write out all these rules, they're just doing functional programming. It's just a it's just a just an obscure notation for for, for writing out a, a type checker in a yeah, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Uh, except they are very, very small, and they are the core type checking rules of uh, of of a practical, of, of a you know a very, very minimal kind of computational uh, calculus uh, for which has type inference as part of its rules. And the key thing here is it has a generalization rule at the bottom. So, and it also, another key thing is, uh, which one, well, anyway, uh, let's, let's, anyway, that is the core of uh, Hindley Milner type inference, and we expand that out to 20,000 lines of F sharp code, uh, because we apply the core idea of Hindley Milner type inference to a much larger language, and a much more complicated set of rules. Uh, now let's talk about what that means in practice. So let's go over to our gist. And so how does F sharp actually process things? So if you have let 
if of x equals x comma x, for example. What does it actually do with these things? OK, so it can pose the declaration structure. OK, so it's worked out it's got a let and it can work out there's an f there and that there's going to be a new value defined called f. So it can, it can create a, a sort of a, an incomplete thing. I've got a val called f and it can say, well, what's its type? OK, and we will uh, we'll, we'll say we don't know what type it has because we haven't looked at any of this yet. It's just a, a F. But then if we allow ourselves to look at this part here, we might say, oh, we're defining a function. So it's going to have a function type. And so it's going to be and I use uh, it's going to be a function from some type to a, another type. And I'll call those types question one and question two. And then we process along and we say, ah, oh, OK, so we've got a right hand side. And then we say, oh, so we're going to check this expression, but we know that it's going to have to. Oh, well, oh we can we can create the environment. So we've got a, a TCN uh, which says X here is going to have type one. OK, so that's kind of the state of play when we get to the right hand side here and we're going to type check a, uh, a tuple expression uh, x uh, a, a syntactic tuple expression so we're going to say oh it's a tuple that means two had to be a tuple so we're going to uh, we're going to basically say that uh, this and i use unifies with uh, three and four okay so two unifies with basically means wherever we had two we can now replace it with three, four, and but we we actually do leave the two lying around, and we solve that two, and I'll represent the solve by um, well, what what will I use? I don't know. Whatever we use is, is going to be confusing. I use a hash just because it's used for a thousand other things. Uh, I think you, you usually use a caret in the uh, chart, okay. right? Uh, no, let's just use Ash. That's all right, sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> so it is, but we effectively are no longer going to see two. We're only going to see three and four. But it's actually done by mutating the type inference variable to say it's got a solution, which is a tuple type. Uh, a tuple types are written like this in F sharp. Three, four. <clears throat> okay. Uh, now we're going to process this X here. And uh, so this, first of all, we were processing x comma x. And now we're processing the first x. Now, but this thing was processed in the context of uh, the expected type was two. Now, the next bit of processing we'll do would be the expected type is three comma four, three star, sorry, three. And we're processing the left-hand side x. And as a result, uh, we are going to get gives. Uh, well, we're going to look up x in the environment, and we're going to see it's a one. Then that's going to give that one has to unify with three. That's all very good. So this thing solves to one. And then we're going to process the X on the other side with a different expected type. We're going to proce uh, process type four. We're going to process X again, which is going to give one unifies with four. So four also solves to one. And then we're done. And we, uh, for each of these, we're going to get a typed abstract syntax tree expression, which is sort of uh, X, the value X, uh, value x here. This one also, this processing also gives that. We come back up the stack. This processing gives a tuple, tuple val x, val x here. And then we go back up the stack and we've eventually got a, uh, this thing gives an TST declaration for f and so on. So what did we get in the end? Simplifying all this down, we got val f goes from one to one star one. Okay, so we and now we're at a let, and this is where we can say, okay, we've now Matt, we've processed the body, 
we've got our TAST expression for the body, and we've got extracted all the type information out of the body. We're done with uh, that. Uh, you know, we've 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 extracted everything we can, and we can sort of ignore the body for type checking. We don't. You know, we'll we'll, we'll keep this for later processing, but. The key thing is we've extracted all the type information and we're not going to go look at the expression again ever. We've extracted the type information and we can now look at this thing and we can say, hey, we can apply generalization and say this is actually automatically generic. And so we put whack a thing called a for all uh, question mark one. Uh, one goes to one comma one as the type of F. And we say we better make this nice. So we're going to call it uh, A here. And that is the end result of the type, uh, the type checking. And now we have F, and we have worked out how generic it is, and we've generalized what we can, and we have completed type inference, and we can continue on to our next declaration, which might be something like a call to F here. <coughs> And of course, uh, the environment it goes back to what it was, and uh, we, X won't has a different meaning now, and so on. Okay, so that is the kind of process of generalizing things. So and, can I can I ask you yeah. a question? Uh, so, but like, uh, what what happens when we first time use the F? Like, we don't have the A anymore, right? Like we have a specific. Uh, that's time. right. So, uh, okay. So let's continue on. So we now are going yeah. to use F, and we'll let's use it at a uh, at a particular type. So let's. Um, I'll, I'll take all of this stuff here and put it in between here, and I will just indent to kind of show that was the, the sub processing that happened for F, and I'll collapse it down a little bit, uh, and I'll collapse it down here. OK, so now we're going to process this. So we create, uh, well, what have we got? We've got a TCN where we've got uh, G, and no, an F in is now in scope, and it has, uh, we've got a F maps. Uh, maps to, I'll just use this as a kind of maps to kind of thing, the TCN. F maps to uh, this val here. I'll just collapse this down here. OK, so that's our name was TCM slash name resolution. And, OK. And we create ourselves a val G and we say we don't know what type it is. Initially, it's uh, we call it back question mark five. That's because we process up to that point. We now process this pattern here, and we invoke the pattern match and whatever else. And it's obviously a unit pattern, and so this breaks down to two things. It's a function. It's got an sorry. First, we see it's got an argument, so it's a function. So that's going to be uh, replace this with question mark six to seven. Then it's going to process this pattern. So uh, TC, this was TC expression here. Uh, TC expression. So now we will call a TC pattern where the known type is tie six. And, uh, and we're going to process the pattern question mark. And that gives the result that question six unifies with unit. Okay, because this is a unit pattern known to the language. Uh, and we will get some residue, some pattern matching residue here. Okay, so question mark six is now solved to the unit. <clears throat> now we've done that much of the of the um, of the language. We now proceed to the right hand side. So we're going to type check TC expression, expression under question mark. The known type is seven. We're going to process F1. And that's going to give, uh, well, what's it going to give? Okay, well, 
we're going to have so we're going to first process f okay so uh, uh okay so uh f f what does f give okay so we look up f in the name resolution environment we see it is val f and we see it is a for all type and we we do what's called freshening that type okay so this is not type uh because this is a function we know it's a function so we will have created a uh two a function type so f here whatever it's going to resolve to it has to be a function because we know it's got an argument okay and so that's why i've broken it down into parts eight and nine okay and so processing f uh gives um uh, so so name resolution on f uh, and gives uh, this thing here with, with that type. And then we do what's called freshening, freshen type of F gives, so we, sorry, we take this for all type this type and we put a new type inference variable in there because it could be used at any type 10 and we substitute it through okay uh so freshening here <coughs> type of f gives that and once we've freshened that then we can start to fill in so then we now unify unify uh eight eight with ten unify nine with the tuple type ten ten okay so we've worked out the type of f here we've worked out the type of this expression here we've worked out how eight and nine <coughs> correspond so we've processed up to this f so we now type check uh the expression one uh, it is the argument type to the application F1 here. So we process it with the argument type 8 here. And the 1 gives question mark 8 unifies with int because it's an integer constant here, or int 32. Uh, and we finally, the result type nine has to match the type here. So in fact, that would have just been matching all the way through, but that would have been question mark seven here as the result type of F1 there. So what have we got there? We, um, oh, because this question mark seven, the result type question, when we completed this, Thing here we got question mark question mark seven uh, unifies with question mark ten the result type here okay so putting that all together what do we get we get val g has type uh, question marks uh, so so filling I won't write that out again actually I will simply fill in the type the information that the information here it was solved to type 10 here uh no i got that wrong this was the return type of f so this seven uh became this 10 10 here and this nine that's right that no i said that was actually seven became 10 10. So seven becomes 10 star 10. And that is all the things we have. Simplifying that to get rid of, to get rid of the solutions, we just have, oh, sorry, ten, uh, da, 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 where did 10 become int, int eight. Eight was unified with 10 and eight was unified with int. So that means 10 became unified with int star int. And so the overall result, so we've finished processing that, we process all of F1, we've processed this return. And, uh, we now have the overall type for G, and we're done with type inference for G, and we're done with this body.
we'll have an application expression, GAST expression, and we can continue on. Okay, so what have we done here? We've had a lot of unification calls, we've had inference unknowns, and we've had solutions to those. And uh, that is the basic action of F sharp type inference. And um, there are a lot of complications. A lot of complications, uh, most of all around recursive structures, uh, which have have very subtly different uh, um, generalization rules, much more complex. And uh, and uh, when you have a type declaration like this, and you have say a bunch of static members. Da, 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 a and one and two with arguments, etc. Then this thing here is effectively processed as if in the same set of rules, as if it was basically a let rec of those two. Okay, let rec this and that. Okay, sort of, uh, sort of from a type checking point of view. You, this is very similar to this and processed by the same overall logic. Uh, mute rec, mutually recursive logic. Okay. So, similarly, uh, you'll notice that in F sharp, the type declarations, object oriented type declarations, are implicitly recursive. Okay, so that means you can call c.m1 in here, and you can call c.m2 in here without needing to use the rec keyword anywhere. And this was, so you don't have to go type rec in here or any other kind of declaration. It's, there's an implicit rec for these things. So this is getting on to uh, mutually recursive. Please. So that's example example one. Actually, I'll do it from the sort of the, the simplest examples of these kind of let recs that don't involve type declarations. Example two involve, involve types. Uh, and example three, so types plus methods. Example three is where at the top of a file, or you might, you you can have a module rec m equals, and then you can have a bunch of types and a bunch of lets, and uh, everything becomes mutually recursive in that scope. You don't need the let, you don't need the rec there, you don't need that. Everything just becomes mutually recursive. You can call everything else. You can call m2, we call it uh, f1, f1, f2. F1 in here, you can call F2, you can call C.M2, uh, you can, and the same thing here, you can call C.M1, here you can call F2, etc. Okay, so that involves types, uh, this involves types and lets, and example four. Here is where you simply, the, the largest scope uh, that we currently support uh, in the F sharp language is where you just have a namespace rec uh, my stuff, and then you have a whole bunch of things. And this is very similar to the uh, the other case above. You'll kind of make your own. This. Okay, so this and these can call m dot f one m dot um, and you can even, well, yeah, okay, you get the idea. Uh, C dot M1. Here you can call F2 directly and so on. Right, so that's recursive stuff. And uh, so we're talking about type inference. And that type inference gets more and more complicated for these mutually recursive processing of things and how generalization applies to those. Um, we'll cover, we'll take a look at that in a bit. Uh, okay, so that's the core of what the F sharp type checker has to do. 
uh, the um, the heart of looking after the 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 bookkeeping of the type information. So I did a lot of bookkeeping there, where I did things like um, these hash solutions. I wrote out these hash solutions here, and I wrote out these unifies calls here, uh, and all of that kind. And I wrote it so this for alls and so on. All of that bookkeeping is done in by Constraint Solver. And uh, let's just take a look at where we store solutions in the data structures. So if we go to the typed tree <coughs> and we look for t-type, so we okay, t-type here, go to definition here, and we look at a variable type indicates that the type is a variable type, regardless of whether it's a declared type variable, it's been generalized or a type automatically generalized or it's a type inference parameter. So let's have a look at a type parameter. OK, and it is a bunch of things, an identifier, flags, a, a unique number and a potential solution. And it is mutable. And that is where that hash that I was drawing is done by setting the type R solution. So if we look at the logic for processing types, uh, so if we look at some of, uh, the, let's take a look in, so for instance, this is a important routine for processing types, and it says uh, we want to basically um, as we're processing something like question mark seven here, which has already been solved to another type, to a tuple type, we we don't we don't we don't want to see the seven. We want the seven to disappear. Okay. Okay. So, in order to make it disappear, we process a type using strip type R equations orcs. And one of the things it does is to say, have we got a type variable, and has it got a solution? And if so, we just use the solution down here. Uh, and we run back around the loop here. And so this thing in its external form called strip type R equations gets used in many, many places. So for example, uh, let's take, actually it'll be, let's take this. Mm, this one here. So if we want to, for instance, check whether something is a, um, a tuple type or a function type, we first strip it. All of these fundamental predicates of which a lot of the processing of the compiler is built, always strip the type first, strip off, look that it looks through any solutions. It actually looks through type abbreviations as well throws them away. Uh, it, does, it doesn't remove them from the tree, uh, but it, 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 it looks through them and then applies the actual predicate. Is it a type variable? Is it a tuple type? And so on. OK, so that's the data structure that underlies type inference, is that, mutable, that single mutable field in the type structure. OK. Uh, and the constraint solver sets that so sets those solutions at key points. So we can let's try and find a place where it sets the solution. Uh, OK, so let's map it from the data structure up. So we want to find the place where type R solution is set. It's not here because it's only a getter. It is not there because that's uh, that's to do with reading stuff off disk. So it doesn't seem to be here. Then let's look through the next file. Here. Here. Uh, that's this shortcut. I'm going to skip that. Uh, no, it's not there. Then let's maybe it's in the constraint solver itself. Okay, here we are. So we're solving it a type parameter equals or unifies with some other type. Okay, so this is what we were doing in that bookkeeping that I was just showing. 
and it ex executes the action of setting the solution to some particular type to some result. Okay. Now the, the constraint solver can be run in an undo mode so that you can during overload resolution we 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 try to solve uh, uh, try to apply some constraints some unifications and if it doesn't work we back everything out and so we keep an, a log a trace of all the mutate mutating actions that we do there's a mutation that hacks on the TAST type structure puts in the solution and if we have to undo the trace this is how we back it out okay so uh, we record an entry in the undo trace so that's how we solve type parameters uh, and that's how those type file solutions get set uh, and for example it, where does that get called that will get called in this unification routine solve one type equals another type we have these two types here and it at some point if it hits two variables and it decides which one it's going to solve for which then it will call solve type i equals type if it's not two variables then it will and it can the thing can still be solved it wasn't declared by the user then we solve the type i equals type okay and that's how we unify things solve type equals type and so let's let's take part of the logic that we did here so let's take for instance the part where we process the number one and i said question mark eight unifies with int so let's see where we process the number one in the type checker uh, and that will be in check expressions And let, let, let's go to TC const. Uh, I will track it down from TC. I will start with here. We're processing a syntactic expression that is a known syntactically to be a constant, like the number one or 1.3. And we, we know its overall type, what it's, we're expecting it to be. And now we process the constant expression and it's various kinds of constant expressions in F-sharp. But this is one of the other kinds. And this case will come to syntactic const in 32. And we call unif with the TC, we look up TC globals and we find the integer type from the F-sharp call library. And we call unify types on the two types. By overall type, what exactly do you mean? Uh, so the overall type, when I was doing my bookkeeping and I said, we're going to call type checking expression with this is what the type that the thing has to have, uh, uh, the overall context of the type. So if you are, uh, for instance, if I've done let X is an int equals five uh, equals four, I say, then because we've got this thing type annotation on the left the overall type coming into that processing of the right hand side is the int we have some known type information in many cases the overall type will be a, ty a type unknown we won't have any information about it uh, but it isn't it doesn't mean it's like the final like solved type it, it has to be e equal to that right. it does it has to be unified with that yes that's right, there's no subsumption uh, that, on that. The thing on the right has to have exactly type in, uh, in this case. If we were processing let x like this declaration, then we would have processed the x and it would have had some unknown overall type, question mark one, and then question mark one is used as the uh, as the type in processing on the right. The inference link, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So all the way through, uh, if we look at TC expression, here, then there's an overall type coming in to this. So this says we're going to check this expression, and the, in the end, the type has to be this thing here. Okay. We're tracking back to where we were with uh, unit with in 32. We will call unify here. Unify will call unify types. Unify will call into the constraint constraint solver to say add me a constraint saying one type equals another type. 
that will uh, give us a constraint solver env environment from various bits and pieces. We solve those two types are equal to various types. We track down a couple of levels with various uh, error handling things. And we get down to the point where we link up with what we just saw before, which is to solve one type equals another type. And uh, then we get down to that solve type R equals type, type part one, set the solution, and we're done processing the number one. Okay. Right. Uh, let's just look a little bit more at the constraint solver signature file uh, because that uh, that unification type equals type was only one of many kinds of constraints that flow into the constraint solver. <clears throat> you can also ask that one type subsume a type. You can also ask to undo, undo. And there is a case where we are, we only do a, a single direction. We only we only solve variables on one side and not the other. Uh, but there are other constraints, uh, and these are specific to the lang F sharp language. And uh, for these constraints are things like: is it a reference type? Is it a value type? And so on. And you might say, well, how do we record that information in the typed tree? Well, so before you before you go into that, do you want to explain about the Solving only one side, or uh, no? I will because <laughs> I will have to look it up, and it may be well be to do with error reporting. I need okay. To, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So how do we store constraints? Uh, well, uh, we looked at the data structure for a type variable, and we we saw the solution for unification, but for constraints, it's in this optional data, because most type variables don't ha actually have other constraints. And you see that these, we again have a mutable slot here, which is a set of constraints attached to a type parameter or inference variable. And there's a set of constraints here, which you can see listed out that something coerces to, defaults to, SRTP constraint. Uh, is it a reference type? Is it an enum? Is it a comparison? Of, uh, supports equality? Is it a delegate or is it unmanaged? That's the full range of constraints for the F-sharp language. And the constraint solver looks after processing all those constraints as well and solving all of those. And we won't look at the details, but they are the entry points for uh, corresponding to all those different kinds of constraints. Uh, we can also mark a type variable as saying, hey, uh, something went wrong. We don't know what it is. It's an error. It's actually possible there's a low-hanging fruit in improving the F-sharp compiler to use this information more uh, effectively to suppress certain errors. Sometimes we continue on processing, continue on producing errors, even though it's obviously associated with some other error. And this information uh, actually is, I think, underutilized in the compiler for better error, for, for preventing cascading error messages. Uh, and I will skip the other things there, but that's a good chunk of the, the um, here the, uh, the the access into the constraint solver. Okay. Uh, right. The you notice this re unit return type the constraint solver either produces diagnostics through the sinks, or it just does some mutation and continues on. There, are, It doesn't build anything. It doesn't build, doesn't give you back a, a witness or anything. Just, just fills stuff in. Uh, okay. So we've looked down through one very simple case of checking expressions. Uh, what I, I will talk a, about a topic which is processing mutually recursive definitions and just one key data structure. So I listed out these cases, these four examples 
are exact of mutually recursive definitions. Uh, and the most extreme being this kind of namespace rec kind of thing. And um, these, I said, these are all processed by the same logic. Uh, and I just want to quickly glance at that logic. Uh, at least the da uh, key data structure in that logic, if I can find it. Is it here or is it in the next file? Okay, so that is this data structure here. And the, the thing is that this thing here represents that shape of stuff that of all of these four cases that I showed. Uh, so we, um, what have we got here? Well, this thing can actually have some open declarations, and that's actually important. So you can have open A, open B, you can have module M1, module M2, module M1. And because this is mutually recursive, you can have open M2 in here. Okay. In fact, I believe you can have open M1 and 2 here, and you can have open M1 there. Okay. Uh, so what have we got here? We've got open declarations, we've got type declarations, we've got module declarations, we've got let declarations, and that corresponds to here. Type declarations, let declarations, modules, you can have, just ignore those, and you can have open, open declarations. I mean, F-sharp does support module abbreviations, but they're very rarely used. M3 equals M1. I mean, we could almost remove these from the language and no one, very few people use these anymore. Uh, that's what that one is. Okay, so now as we're processing these mutually recursive things, we effectively do about eight or ten phases of processing, if you believe it or not, in order to process this kind of structure. Because we start by, for instance, identifying, I'll just use that comment thing. Uh, so we, for instance, we start by just finding out, well, hey, what types are we actually defining here? And then this thing might be generic, and we say, wait, well, hey, what type What type parameters? So initially, we don't process the generic parameters. We just say, hey, we're defining something called C. Then we say, oh, we've got some type parameters. And then, oh, this thing might have constraints uh, in here. And so that's three phases already, and we're only at the point where we've just processed these kind of things. We've got three, so incrementally, we enrich the structure more and more to kind of get uh, a little bit more information on each phase, okay? And then, yeah, the next thing is we will uh, introduce the values for the constructor, and we will do the values for M1 and M2 and F1 and F2 down there. I'll scrap M2 to the moment. Uh, and then we'll start processing M1. We'll process its pattern here. We'll actually do all the patterns first. So we'll do here, okay, and we'll do the patterns for F1, and we'll do the patterns for F2 here. And notice we've got a whole lot of simultaneous environments here. The environment for M1 is different to the is environment for F2, because in M1, X is in scope, but Y is in scope uh, for M2. Okay, so we've got to keep, we've got to do the bookkeeping associated that we've got in at each part of the structure that we're expanding. We've got more and more information available. So now we can finally go on and start to process a body, okay, an actual expression, and we can start to process this expression here. Okay, that's nice. And so we run along, and then we've got to apply generalization. And in a recursive structure, we apply generalization incrementally. If, if, if we know everything about M1, if it's fully annotated as a generic thing, and we've got all its information, then we can generalize, then we generalize it as soon as we can. We don't wait until everything else is done. And that, that's uh, quite key, actually, to allowing uh, various bits of object-oriented programming to drop out in F-sharp. Okay, so we pro start processing the bodies one by one. 
etc. And there are a few more phases uh, uh, tucked away associated with uh, things like union types and record types and um, other, uh, there's a whole mess associated with structs because uh, yeah, yeah, you can have structs in F sharp uh, where people um, take the two structs as uh, as arguments, as fields, for example, creating an implicit struct of struct of, of infinite size, uh, like this. Uh, then my x dot uh, c equals c. Okay, so that's not a good struct. That struct is not realizable. It's a bug in the user code because uh, there's no such struct that has finite size. So we have to find those kind of errors in that in this phased phased processing of type definitions and other mutually recursive things. Uh, okay, if you want to, if you're wondering why does that relate to being mutually recursive, well, some somebody can actually have two structs that play that kind of game with you. Uh, it's an S1, S1, S2, S2. And now uh, that is now is also not, not allowed because this thing is of infinite size. So we we have to solve those kind of uh, problems as we real what's called sort of realizing or establishing type definitions and modules and finally processing their expression bodies. Okay, and all of this has to be done for one of these phase by phase bit by bit over an entire file, okay? So the F-sharp type checky is most definitely not single phase. It is actually about 10 or 12 phases. C-sharp has, sim of course, many of the same problems. Any object or typed object oriented language has the same kind of type realization problem. In fact, even the .NET common language runtime has an awful lot of phases just to load a type. And you're welcome to go look at uh, class.cpp or method table.cpp or class load.cpp in the .NET common language runtime implementation. And you'll see those phases of establishing types are actually share some similarity with what goes on in the F sharp compiler. It's even more complicated in the .NET common language runtime because it does it concurrently. So you can have multiple concurrent type loads of the same related set of types in action from different threads. And that has to be done in a thread safe way. And it has to be done in a way where if anything goes wrong, all the resources are given back on all threads. Uh, and uh, if you want to look at some fun code, uh, that is some really, really interesting code to try to try to work out, especially since it's all in C++, but it's done it's quite nicely. So we have, an, we have this structure and we have this incremental phase by phase enrichment of this structure. And that is mediated by this mutually recursive shapes. And uh, we, given a shape, for instance, we can perform a map function across that where we uh, enrich the type construct, the, the data associated with types. We enrich what's associated with lets and with modules. And there's various other kind of uh, functional things across those structures. Uh, and some mappings from folding, some iterating, and so on. And these, this is what we know about things initially, which is just syntax, okay? And then this is what we know after phase one, or the first three or four phases, there are some phases in these. And so we have some definitions and we have some information we've extracted. And then we have what do we know after phase two? Well, we've actually got some bindings uh, and we, for each module, we've established various things. And then finally, at the end, yeah, this is what we know at the very end of everything, I think. Uh, but you can see that you know, we get richer and richer inf information down the phases. And if we search for these things, you'll see, for instance, phase 2A, create recursive values and check argument patterns. That was part of what I just explained, where we establish that set of values and we actually go and check the arguments, and we establish the arguments. Uh, and down and down we go, these mutually recursive shapes, until finally we've kind of processed everything and everything is enriched and we can move on with checking of the file. Okay. Right, I think that is all I want to say about mutual recursion. Um, uh, you can, I mean, each of these phases will, will drop out as some sort of uh, 
structural fold or structural mapping across that set of mutually recursive shapes, um, uh, such as this one here. Or well, well, there are lots of other examples. Here's another one here. Phase to be type check and, and incrementally generalize the definitions. Phase to B. Let's, let's run down and look at the different phases. Phase to C, fix up recursive references. So let Rex, we have to do a little bit of uh, hacking to get final things right. Uh, extract implicit field and method bindings. So this is for, where's our gist? Uh, this is if you had a let definition in here, uh, f of x equal uh, x plus y, and it might have captured some field from the outside here. So we have to extract those out uh, to become methods. It's done in the type checker, that's here. Phase 2D. Let's see where these are called. Uh, phase 2C, phase 2D. We uh, rewrite values to make sure we can catch exceptions on initialization, and we are done. So, da 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 da, da where do we want? So, this was sort of all in mutually recursive definitions definition phase two bindings. Right. Um, we need a few more comments. Basically, every phase like this should have a big fat comment on it. So I apologize where there are some places where they are not present. For instance, that is not an adequate comment. We should have we should absolutely document every single phase and translate every single thing we do over those mutually recursive phases. OK. Right, so checking declarations, constraint solving. We're going to skip checking computation expressions and skip post inference checks. And I think we can take some questions. Have I have we had any questions along the way that I've missed? Type inference looks like a good place for f sharp .data .adaptive. That is a good question. When I first showed f sharp .data .adaptive to Matthew Parkinson at Microsoft Research, he said, you could use that to incrementalize your compiler, couldn't you? By, uh, uh, in, in theory, you could make uh, a lot of the compiler built on top of sort of adaptive or incremental data structures. And uh, Will and I keep talking about that and uh, about how, where we can start to use more sort of adaptive um, like things. W w it would be probably way too much to put it into the type checker itself or the constraints over itself at that granularity. We would be more adaptive at a, at a slightly larger granularity. For instance, uh, we might be able to use data.adaptive to allow you to, to um, replace the bottom portion of the file and only check the subsequent part of the file rather than recheck the entire file or even just to replace the current method and then do a check whether to see whether your your typing in the current method has affected the inferred type of the method uh, and then and then and then and then become much more incremental in that way uh, okay Uh, talk about signature files. Yes, is there a way to generate your signature files as a starting point for bigger projects? Yes, there is a dash dash sig uh, and generates a massive thing. But, um, you know, it actually doesn't work perfectly and it doesn't insert triple slash comments. It doesn't preserve those. And uh, it could also automatically generate the XML comments. That would also be quite nice. And it's actually not that hard to fix those things. I've and uh, it'd be even better if there was a right-click um, action in the IDE, which just said add signature file, uh, and that did all of those things. And I think now that signature files have started to give tooling improvements, um, people might start to want to use them an awful lot more. So I'd really encourage people on the call who've been following this to really look at actually just fixing stuff in 
the basic printing. Many of the bugs are just simple bugs in nice print, uh, which is uh, which is ultimately what we use to generate those signature files. For example, uh, you'll if you look through nice print, there isn't anywhere where we look at the XML doc uh, here. I just search for XML doc. There's no use of it anywhere in this file, I believe. Just double check. Yep, no. So, sorry. Nice print here. So, for example, if we were generate, imagine we were generating this signature file, and we had this type thing. We, we were literally generating this text, so we were generating a type declaration or a val declaration. If we use dash dash sig to generate this, we wouldn't have any triple slash comments. Now, if we search through val for uh, uh, nice print for where we generate val. Hmm. Val, where do we generate val? It must be defined uh, somewhere else. Keyword val here. So let's go back to nice print and find out where we generate keyword val. It's generated in a few different places, value and type, for example. It generates the keyword, it generates some type parameters, it generates a colon, it generates a type. Uh, and it uses this layout DSL to give these nice indentation. But we could simply add a thing in here to generate the XML doc, okay? Put the XML doc, or uh, uh, add the XML doc. We've probably got the XML doc. It's probably in v dot XML doc. There it is. Okay, so I think the data is available. Uh, I'm not going to use it. Uh, so we could probably just chuck it in here and put the XML doc in front of the existing val type and null, combining those two somehow. And then that would be a fix for signature file generation, which would be genuinely useful uh, for, for the community long term. Then we did generate uh, val in a few other places, um, but I think they're to do with other, uh, they're to do with fields and classes. So no, that, that was the important one there. Okay, uh, so we could add XML docs to SIGs, okay. Yes, FSC. So yes, you can just add a, a dash dash sig to your other flags uh, in your project file. I think someone's probably, yes, other flag sig library FSI. That's correct. Uh, you need to split out. That's right. You get one. You get one. I actually generate a sig all dot FSI. And then I just go and cut out the parts that I want to make my own signature file. So yes, somebody if somebody could just say a dash dash sig files, which generates all the signature files, or, or does it as an IDE action, that'd be really cool. Uh, okay. Let's take a look through other questions. Ah, so else is F sharp F sharp uh, finally no longer in use? Well, it's always there as a backup, long term spiritual home of. F sharp if we ever need it, uh, if the .NET Foundation disappears, which is <laughs> ever going to happen. So I don't know. I guess it's dead. Yes, this, uh, this F sharp repository is used, and uh, this is entirely in archive mode. And so you're just curious about like the situation with like building it and like package you know, like packages for various distributions and stuff like that. That is, like all, uh, is all yeah. done through the, building the .NET SDK. F# -sharp is part of the .NET SDK, and the, S, the .NET SDK is the primary unit of packaging and distribution now. Uh, so um, we don't, in a way, F# -sharp is not packaged independently of that at all anymore, uh, except as F# -sharp compiler service, and, and that, uh, that, 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 that's all. None of those packagings that used to be listed here. Uh, we there none of these things uh, 
active anymore as far as I'm concerned. Uh, um, I guess this is even Mono, I think, is drawn directly from .NET F Sharp. Uh, even, I mean, uh, Mono is still being packaged, uh, but it's drawn from a commit on .NET F Sharp now. I think it is right now, yeah. yeah. All archived. Okay. Don't they just take built binaries now? I don't know what they do, Kevin. I, I think, think they just take built binaries. Okay, great. But it's that sounds right. I was looking for the old... Um Python packaging scripts for F sharp in the old mono packaging areas and couldn't find it anymore. Mm -hmm. Anyway, whatever they do. Uh, let's uh, move on. Okay, okay, so c let's have more questions or uh, we've been t two hours. It's probably time to wind up. Uh, but let's just do any more questions from anyone on on checking inference. Anything I've forgotten? Anything you, you want to ask? Yes, I have uh, one question, Don. Um, does in constraint solving is there backtracking? Is that what the uh, undo is for? Yes, there is. And now uh, most of what happens in check expressions does not use backtracking. Uh, but when you come to method overload resolution, we have to do backtracking. So you can imagine that if you're let's go to my gist again. Uh, if you if you, if you're doing uh, a call to system dot console dot right line and you're passing some expression in here, okay? And you've got to do resolve between 15 different overloads. You don't have the solutions from one attempt at an overload to interact with the next overload. So we do use the constraint solver during method overload resolution. We do, uh, for instance, if you have a method which, for instance, has uh, x of type t, and y of type t, uh, then you call m at type 3 and uh, x or something. Uh, then 3 will unify, t, with, t will unify with int, and then this gets set to int. Well, when we freshen this, this you know, well, uh, you know, yeah. we get to we are 1. One. And then one, then one gets solved to int. Uh, uh, then, uh, then when you type check this argument, for instance, you'll have a known type of int. Okay, and uh, but now you don't want the. Um, uh, so let's say you were type checking something like this fragment. Let f of x equal this then this yeah. will successfully uh, infer type x is mm -hmm. int. Now, but if this, su if this subsequently failed overload resolution, uh, string, and you, you put 3.0 in here, and these two don't match, then you certainly need to backtrack out of that thing of x being int. Ah, I see. And you have to move on to the next overload, which may well work, okay, like this one. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, and get some completely different type for X. You might get um, single like this, and then X, then F will be inferred to type single to and to be calling this overload. Okay. And it's you know, yeah. and and if if this is uh, like if if we cannot resolve it, if it's ambiguous, we just ask the user to specify like to to give the hints explicitly, explicit yeah. right? That, that, that's right. We don't, um, when you have, so method overload resolution in F sharp is uh, console, solved using the known type information up to the syntactic point. And I've been indicating that sort of, no, that notion of known type information by, by doing those marks about how much we've processed so far. So there's this sort of, it's sort of top to bottom, left to right, except in this mutually recursive case where it's sort of outside in. Okay. Uh, and so we've got to a certain point where we've, got a certain amount of information extracted from the files and the, the type signatures and the implementations. Then we've got an overload problem to resolve. We use the known type information and run the constraint solver in um, 
in uh, in with undo mode, and we try each of the overloads. And and that's right. If we get a failure on that basis, it's a type checking error. We report the error. We ask for more information. Okay. Some other languages or some other potential designs in this kind of space might have might put down a constraint which says, well, we, we, we didn't manage to work out what C.M is, but we gave it a shot, but we're, we're going to continue on with this constraint uh, in, 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 in process. We don't do that for overload resolution. We demand, if you're doing overload, using overload, we, we demand to get the resolution upfront based on the known type information. Is, there, uh, is that just for like, uh, like, Usability reasons, or like it's it, it's for but it's for a bunch of reasons. Mainly because the actual constraint we would have to lay down would have to include uh, potentially generic things like this, and it's actually very hard to lay down a constraint because this becomes a a a, 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 um, a higher kinded constraint. Effectively, we don't know how generic that thing is. Uh, and that can't be summarized. You can't even write SRTP constraints, which uh, cover all these cases. SRTP constraints can't cover generic things like this. Uh, so, uh, yes, that's the main technical reason. Is is the, the constraint is literally too complex. Let alone, it's even worse when you take into account all the implicit conversions that happen, converting the link expressions. Converting to delegates, uh, uh, parameter. There's, there's basically because we have to interoperate with C Sharp at this point and, and follow a lot of their style of rules in their object oriented in their object programming model. We can't capture method overloading as a constraint. It's too complex. I think for SRG, for SRGB, it does work for limited situations. Exactly. Right? Exactly. It does to limited situations, but you can't. Uh, kind of abstract over uh, generalized, yeah, yeah, the, the full range of things. That's that's right. Uh, I mean, frankly, in F sharp, yeah, even at any of the things I listed would would just make it too complex. Plus, there's the other factor, which is error messages. It is a whole lot better if you give right, a, sure, yeah, give a error error upfront. Yeah. Okay, and uh, another question from anyone. All right, so thank you so much for sitting through that. I'm glad we've got this on tape uh, so that for future reference, uh, uh, I think this is by far the most detailed in-depth dive we've ever done on the uh, on the type checker. I must say it's a lot more fun to give it. Now we've done a couple of cleanup passes uh, that I, I you know, I used to come to the type checker just even six months ago and say, oh my God, I couldn't, I hate explaining this, it's too complex, this file's too big, and things aren't divided out in, in proper ways. But now looking through all the signature files are written, things are split out into more logical chunks, I was able to deal with the core essence of what um, of what we had and uh, of, of the structures that are there. So I'm really happy with, this, with the, the situation in the code base. Uh, and um, for those for that for that part of the, the of the compiler, and uh, great thanks, great to have you all on the call, and happy to take any more questions if anyone's there. And I hope everyone is staying safe and well. And I am certainly glad to looking forward to seeing some of you in person again when this pandemic thing is finally over. And Right. Any more? Any more questions? Otherwise, we can wind up. Thank you again, Vlad, for organizing these calls and arranging the topic suggestions from the community. Thanks, Don. Pleasure. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Kevin.